it's just too intensive a radiation, too short of a half-life, and too difficult of a synthesis to ever possibly be used in that way. Hey, everybody. Professor Davis here, ChemSurvival.com, YouTube channel, ChemSurvival. And uh, I'm getting ready for another Molecule Monday. Everything's going great. I've got my chip of doom right here so that we can take a look firsthand at the effects of capsaicin on the human body. And then something happened. I caught a movie last night, and I want to take a complete detour and talk about this instead. I promise we will get back to, uh, to watching me torture myself with these chips, uh, but I'm going to do that another week because this week I want to talk to you instead about polonium. Now, polonium is a really fascinating element. You're going to find it right over here on the periodic table, element number 84, just a couple of atomic numbers past lead, the last truly stable element that we know of, at least. No one's ever found a stable isotope of anything past lead. Uh, bismuth 209, very, very close. That isotope of bismuth actually is radioactive, but it is so weakly radioactive, its half-life is many-fold greater than the life of the known universe. But polonium, on the other hand, uh, doesn't have any particularly stable isotopes, and it's actually rather notorious for its radioactivity. So you can probably guess where I'm going with this if you're a Netflix fan. Uh, the other night I caught the film Kate, which was a fantastic romp of a movie. This lady kicks some, some serious tail up and down Japan over about a 15-hour period as this mysterious radioactive poison slowly works its way through her system. Uh, it creates for a really fun story, but is that poison really possible? Is that kind of thing that a clandestine assassin might use to take someone out? Well, when I first saw the movie, I thought to myself, she's in the hospital with her poisoning, and the doctor asked if she has any has had any uh, exposure to to radio or, or radioactive materials. And I know exactly where this is going. And sure enough, she says polonium, two ten, right? And then the doctor stuns her by saying, "No, it's polonium two o four." Well, I got real excited with that polonium two ten comment because that actually is a, a a known radiological poison. It has been used in the past for some pretty nefarious stuff because it actually does have some properties that make it sort of an ideal radiological poison. But the implication in the film, of course, is that, no, 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 this is 204, which is, which is much more, more dangerous and deadly than 210. And that sparked a lot of questions on the internet. Is polonium 204 legit? And can it be used as a poison? And if so, is it really any worse than polonium 210 could possibly be? So I took a look into that. Uh, so let's start by asking ourselves a few questions about what makes something a good poison. Uh, if something's going to be a good poison, the first thing we're going to have to be able to do is make it. Right? If you can't make a poison, you can't use the poison. Well, the next thing we've got to do is we've got to be able to transport the poison. You've got to get it from where you made it to where you intend to use it without inadvertently killing or hurting the person who's doing the delivery. And then finally, you've got to ask yourself, you know, will this poison actually work uh, to, to kill the individual that I'm, that I'm out to get, right? So can polonium-204 do all this? And we can actually answer most of these questions with a visit to just one website. And that is the Brookhaven National Labs nuclear data site, which I've got up on my screen over here. So what we have here is what is essentially what we call the nuclear stability curve. And it shows how the ratio of neutrons to protons influences the stability of ever more massive elements. Our horizontal axis here is the number of neutrons in a nucleus, and the uh, vertical axis, the number of protons. Okay, great. Now, the black entries here that you see, those little black squares, represent isotopes that are known to be stable. That is to say, they do not radioactively decay at all. And you probably notice initially that that ratio of neutrons to protons is very close to 1. But as we continue toward ever and ever more massive elements, it curves in the direction of neutrons. And eventually, it actually conks out when we get up here to lead, the last stable known nucleus, of course. Uh, but this chart tells us so much more. Uh, by looking at this chart, we can get an idea of whether an isotope is neutron rich or neutron deficient. So if we have an unstable nucleus that is going to decay radioactively, we could answer this question, how is it going to decay uh, in, in, in order to achieve a more stable state? Right? Well, let's zoom in a little bit here on polonium and see what we find. All right, I'm going to get down into polonium here. 
And then what I'm going to do once I get down there is I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this so we can see some of those individual isotopes and, and uh, some of the data about their nuclear stability and their radioactive decay properties. Okay, and here we are. We're zoomed in on that region of the uh, nuclear stability curve that contains polonium. So here we've got our, our black squares. Remember, those represent elements that are actually genuinely stable. <clears throat> and these other colors are sort of a, a gradient that lets us know uh, exactly how unstable, how quickly something will decay radioactively. So let's start by looking at polonium-210. So here is my polonium row, and there is the isotope polonium-210. Now I can get two important pieces of information from the Brookhaven website here. The first is the half-life. So the half-life of polonium-210 is 138 days and change. What that means is that if I could make polonium-210, 138 days after I make my sample of polonium-210, half of that polonium-210 has undergone a decay into another element. And that decay is an alpha decay. So my, uh, let me get back to my polonium here. 210 decays completely by an alpha emission, which means that I would make my way down to lead 206, a stable isotope, through an alpha decay. That's a helium nucleus that's being ejected. Okay, this is why polonium works so well as a radiological poison. It only emits alpha particles, and it, it lasts long enough to actually be delivered and there is, of course, a way that we can make polonium-210 relatively easily through the neutron bombardment of bismuth-209. So neutron bombardment of bismuth-209 leads to polonium-210 through a beta decay. The polonium-210 lasts long enough we can get it where we want it, and it releases alpha particles, which are extremely damaging once ingested, but are not particularly dangerous to us when we're exposed to it externally. These relatively large particles tend to just kind of bounce off of us in many instances. Now, I'm not saying alpha radiation is totally safe, but I am saying it's not particularly dangerous to carry around in your pocket if you're a, an assassin you know, traveling the globe trying to take out a target. But polonium-204 is different. It has been made in the past. It has been characterized. It is on the Brookhaven website. Let's take a look at where it comes in. So here's polonium-204. Now, when I look at polonium-204, I immediately see two problems, and a little bit of thought will actually lead us to a third problem as far as using this as a poison. The first problem is that the half-life of this isotope is only three and a half hours. So what that means is if I could make a significant amount of polonium-204, that that significant amount would decay 50% right, every three and a half hours. So if I'm running a radiological poison lab, I doubt that I'm doing it in the middle of a major city like this story is carried out. So I imagine it's going to take at least a few hours after making this poison to transport it, get it to the guy who's supposed to deliver it, and get it into the victim. Which means that after about, you know, let's say three of these half-lives, I've gone from a full complement of my isotope to half, to a quarter, to only about 12 and a half percent, and so on. So it doesn't seem like a very good idea to me to create a radiological poison that vanishes within about 24 hours. It's gone. And it's no longer effective. So the half-life is just too short. And the other concern I have about this is that the decay mode is a beta emission. And that's what this epsilon over here means in my entry for polonium-204. So the vast majority of those radioactive decays that give polonium-204 its short half-life are actually high-energy positrons, not helium nuclei. And those high-energy positrons are far more penetrating, which means that an assassin would need to protect themselves from that poison as well because external exposure is enough to potentially irradiate and poison oneself while trying to deliver the poison to your ultimate target. So we've already got two strikes against polonium-204. Strike number one, the half-life is just too short. It'd be very difficult to make, transport, and use before it's almost all gone. Second, the decay mode is all wrong. Right? A beta radiation, beta decay is too penetrating of a radiation. It would be very difficult not to poison ourselves from the outside while trying to get it inside of the victim. And finally, the third strike is the one we have to think a little bit more about. And that is, could we even make a significant amount of polonium-204. Well, let's take a look at it. Okay, Once again, polonium-204, atomic number 84, uh, atomic mass of 204. Now, some of the common ways to make heavier elements include bombardment with alpha particles, hoping that you'll capture the entire alpha particle, 
Another fairly simple way to create modestly heavy nuclei like polonium is the neutron bombardment of other species. Now, 210 is made this way. Neutron bombardment of bismuth 209 leads to bismuth 210, which quickly transmutes into polonium 210 through a simple beta decay. Now, the problem, of course, is that in order to make polonium 204, we'd have to start with bismuth 203. Well, let's take a look at bismuth 203. If we we're going to try a neutron bombardment to get our polonium 204, we're going to have to go down here and find bismuth 203. Here we are. Well, bismuth 203 only has a half-life of about 12 hours. So if I could make the target for the neutron bombardment, I would lose 50% of my target every half day that I keep trying to make my polonium sample. So that's not going to work terribly well. Okay, how about another technique here? So we've got our polonium-204. Let's try to make that with an alpha bombardment. Let's hope it can just capture an alpha particle. Well, that's going to be two protons plus two neutrons, which means that we're going to go down to an atomic number, right? and then we're going to have to go over to, there we go, to compensate for that helium nucleus. Now we're trying to use lead-200 as a target. And lo and behold, lead 200 also has a very short half-life. So I'm not 100% sure how we're going to make a significant amount of this stuff. Clearly enough can be made that its radiation characteristics and half-lives can be measured, but could enough really be made to use as a radiological poison considering the fact that its half-life is so short and that we would have to find ways to protect the people who are supposed to deploy that poison from the poison itself? So I would submit to you that the answer is no. So polonium-204, does it exist? Yes. Can it be made? Yes. Is it the perfect, most diabolical radiological poison that I could conceive of? No, not even for polonium. The fact is polonium-210 would definitely be a much wiser choice if someone were really out to use this uh, as a radiological poison. All right, so that's my take on the use of the polonium radiological poison in the movie Kate. Honestly, polonium-210 would have made a perfect fit for that story. I don't really know why they felt the need to change the isotope to 204, which seems to me as though it's just too intensive a radiation, too short of a half-life, and too difficult of a synthesis to ever possibly be used in that way. Uh, but if you think differently, I'd love to hear about in the comments below. I'm always eager to learn new things about new elements in their isotopes, so drop some comments down there. Uh, don't forget to uh, like, share, and especially subscribe to the channel. Ring the bell if you would like to be notified when I do finally consume my chip of doom and explain what's going on there, hopefully in one of my uh, upcoming YouTube videos. In the meantime, uh, please take a look at chemsurvival.com. That's my website where you can learn everything about me, all my projects, including my courses with Wondrium, advice on good tutors if you're taking uh, chemistry courses. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. I'm Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. See you next time.